Boom. Here's another one of my pop culture roadshow, Tom Ray's pop culture roadshow videos where I look at some of the items that I've collected over the years from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s and see if I can't find out a little something about them, the makers, or the artists involved. She likes me. So, uh, talking toys. I wanted to know when those started. I wanted to know, this is a polstering one. This one is more from the 70s, I believe. This is from 1976. But before I get into that, I wanted to know, like, when did they start to begin with? And the first one, and I feel like this should be obvious, plus there was an entire PBS, like, series about it, but Thomas Edison created the first talking toy in... I guess he invented the doll in 1877, but began introducing them and manufacturing them in 1890. When he created the phonograph, he said, what else can we do with the phonograph? And he tried to think of all the different uses for the phonograph to, to like what it could be used for instead of just like, hey, play recordings. And he was trying to think of like conventional uses. And one of them was he thought he could make tiny little wax cylinders to put inside of dolls that were like, I want to say they were like two feet tall, maybe. So they were big dolls. And what he did is he created a tiny wax cylinder and the metal, the body was metal and it had holes punctured in the middle like this so you could hear it. Now the problem was is that the dolls themselves were, uh, so the heads would be porcelain, the arms and legs would be porcelain, body was metal. And the thing was, is recording on the cylinders still wasn't perfected yet. He would have women in the factory that worked there. They had to record, he wanted to record their voices for the dolls. But in order to record, there was like, all right, so like a little funnel and it would, they would record onto the disc. But for it to actually record, they would have to yell into it. So the voices that came out were a woman's voice. It plays warbly, so it's spooky. And it's kind of terrifying because it's one of those, they're porcelain head dolls. They got this weird, mysterious, like yelling, high-pitched voice coming out of their bodies. And they didn't sell well. He marketed them for a few short weeks and then they did poorly. One, because of uh, the wax cylinders did not ship well. So people would get them, they would be broken. Um, and then the ones that did get them, I guess it, and not surprisingly so, it did scare children. And I guess the one thing, it wasn't necessarily the voice that scared the children. It was because of this new technology and things talking, kind of like when people saw the first film, uh, you know, it was a train coming at it and people thought, oh no, the train's coming to get us. It was, they had never seen this before. Children were freaked out that the mouth didn't move when it spoke. And I guess uh, even Edison himself started referring them to them as uh, little monsters. He called the dolls little monster dolls. And uh, so that was, so he nixed that, they stopped making them. Fast forward, the next talking doll that was invented were called mama dolls. So they were the dolls that if you lean them back, they would go mama, like that. And what that was is they had no actual recording devices in them. Have you ever seen those novelty, they're like little cans and they make cow noises. Like they're like little discs you turn them upside down and then turn them back and they go, Bleh. well, it's essentially just, there's a little wooden device with um, an accordion sort of thing in it. And so when you would turn the doll, it would make a high pitched noise and it would go, mama. And it sounded like it was saying mama. So there were no moving parts, but they, uh, those were popular in the twenties and thirties. And the thing inside was called a cry box. So that was, that was the little device. I really wish I had one right now, but I think you know what I'm talking about, right? When you turn it upside down, the, popular actual talking toy that came after that was by Mattel and it was called the Chatty Cathy. So this doll would say 11 different phrases like let's play house. The voice of Chatty Cathy was June Foray who is the voice voice of uh, Rocky in the Rocky and Bullwinkle and like tons of other things. Uh, the voice of uh, the Wicked Witch on the Looney Tunes cartoons with uh, Bugs Bunny. Hey, Bugs Bunny. Um, so that's who the voice of Chatty Cathy was. They elaborated on the, the, uh, the Edison idea. 
there were these children's toys by Mattel. I think it was Mattel, but they were little record players, but they were meant for little kids, so they couldn't scratch, and they were actual plastic discs. Like, they had huge grooves in them. Like, they were literally plastic. They were not vinyl. They were not meant to be records, but they were kind of like music boxes, and you would put them on like a record player, and it would play it, and it had it, it would just kind of vibrate the noise from that. It wasn't... It, it was a very, very basic, sturdy plastic cylinder. Now that is, they created that and that's how they elaborated on that, made smaller ones inside and you would pull it by doing the pull string. Oh, and to make mention of uh, the way that the, the Edison doll was done is it had a crank. So you had to crank that one to play this. This one, they took the same idea with the more sturdy plastic thing, although it doesn't necessarily sound better uh, but you would power it by the pull string. And then it would say this. Oh, you're supposed to say different things. Well, he just likes me. Next goes to uh, this one I wanted to learn more about. The Tickle Me Elmo doll. <laughs> Fell out of my hand there for a second. The Tickle Me Elmo doll came around in, I want to say, 96, I think it was. And the people who invented it, it was invented by Greg Hyman and Ron Dubrin. 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 Either one of those. Maybe not either of those. But that's how I'm pronouncing it. That's the way it looks like it's when it's spelled. So they invented some toy. It was a computer toy. And then later on, they wanted to make something that tickled or laughed when you tickled it. And they created a doll called Tickles the Chimp. So originally this was a chimpanzee toy. They brought it to Tyco, and Tyco um, had the rights originally to Looney Tunes, not to Sesame Street. And Tyco was like, nobody wants a chimp. They said, but we have the rights to um, Looney Tunes. So first what they did is there was a, they made a Tickle Me Tasmanian Devil doll because they wanted to try and market one of their more unlikable characters. Well, they did that. Then Tycho actually lost the rights to uh, the Looney Tunes characters, but then they gained the rights to Sesame Street. And then they made one of their most popular character, Elmo. <laughs> now, last up, I'd gone over one of the artists in, I got a bunch of these books here. Uh, old children's books with great illustrations in them. And they also have really well-known illustrators who did these books. So these, a lot of these are from the 60s. And I've sold quite a bit of them. But this one is a Yogi Bear and the Cranky Magician book. And the artwork in it is really, really, really cool. So here's the Angry Magician. And here is like the background work in it is really good. Uh, just the illustration is the illustration is really cool. So the person who did it is named Mel Crawford. So first of all, he did not start out doing this. Uh, for Mel Crawford, he was uh, from Canada and he uh, originally did fantasy and horror comics. He did uh, mystery and horror comics, or fantasy and horror comics, and one of them was for Boris Karloff, Tales of Mystery. And of course, none of the ones he did is in here, but this is the type of style that he had done. The, a lot of the comics were drawn this way. That was what he started out as, and he did it for Western Publishing, which I covered a whole thing about Western Publishing in a previous Pop Culture Roadshow. He was well sought after because he was good at adapting the graphic styles of other artists. So he could hop onto a project or if there was like, say a comic book artist or a comic strip artist who wanted to take a vacation, they wouldn't have to draw a bunch of stuff ahead of time. He would be able to draw and look, the stuff he did would look just like theirs. One of the first illustrated comics he worked on was, uh, it was called The Three T's, which was a Canadian children's comic and that was by Frank Mann Harris. 
and he drew that. But then his uh, drawing career was cut short because World War II happened and he served in the uh, Canadian Navy. So when he came back, he studied at the Royal Ontario College for Art. And then after he was done with that, moved to the U.S. Between like 1949 and the, I think, 70? Something like that. But started doing lots of children's type comics too for uh, Western Publishing. Drew for Mr. Magoo, which was at the time a uh, UPA cartoon. And then Gerald McBoing Boing and Boing Boing. Boing Boing. And uh, J. Ward's Rocky and Bullwinkle. So he could adapt to those styles. So that's why he would do that. Um, but then he also did the Tales of Mystery and all that kind of stuff. But while he was doing that, he started uh, also doing children's books and kind of finding his style kind of, I feel like the way he did these, because he also liked to paint. And then for a while, he went and worked as an animator at Disney in the 1950s. But uh, he quit because he said, um, illustrating children's books and uh, record covers suited him better. He enjoyed doing that a lot more. So he quit and did that. And that's all I got. So... That is the stuff I learned today. Thank you for watching the show. I like you. So, so long. <laughs>